dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Mother Natalia. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. I should just try to make funny faces in the five seconds before we go on. Just try to make you <laughs> laugh before you say glory to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Um, this was just like, I was like, I'm going to bite my nails and I'm looking up and you're looking very intently. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why yeah, you were biting your nails. Yes. Um, I don't know why, but it's like, as soon as you hit record, I just, I all of a sudden want to laugh. Even if you haven't said something, I just, I, there's so much, I feel so much joy when we record usually, uh, not every time, but. So like if I make a joke that I want you to laugh at, I should just like somehow hit record in the middle of the recording and you'll <laughs> you'll laugh at that instead. <laughs> I just laughed at your joke. Uh-huh. That was nice. I do think you're funny, Father Michael. I really do. I think this was the quickest. We did such a good job. This was the quickest that we actually like got to prayer and recording once we got on Squadcast. Yeah. We usually spend that's like we were just talking minutes. earlier. That's true. <laughs> that's because we talked for like an hour earlier. <laughs> it is spiritual direction before this. That's true. Um, I don't, I don't know what to banter about. I know we don't have to have banter, but. Do you really want me to just to make up something again? No, because that was really annoying the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Not oh, annoying. You. It wasn't annoying. It was, that wasn't the right word. I, it just was, um. Random, but random is okay. Sometimes. Well, let, let me ask you this then. Um, okay. What have you felt any changes after leaving honeymoon mm. until this moment? Because honeymoon is just a whole different world for you after your life profession. Have you felt any changes in in your motherhood, in your nunhood, in your relationship with Jesus, mm. relationship with the other nuns from that moment you left, walked out until right now? Uh, that's kind of a loaded question. You look the same. I do. <laughs> you do. I'm just. <laughs> the, I mean, when I when I came when I came off honeymoon, mother mother was insistent that I was glowing, uh, and so were some of the nuns. But uh, let's see what's different. So, I I think Mother Petra had the same experience of this. We were talking about it the other night, but I was we were telling someone that we're we're both feeling pretty overwhelmed by the transition, but it's not, it's not actually, I expected it to be a difficult transition spiritually and emotionally to come back Mm -hmm. into just life at the monastery after eight days of, of solitude and, and intense prayer, but it hasn't at all been a difficult transition spiritually or emotionally. It simply is a difficult transition logistically, uh, practically Mm -hmm. speaking of there's just so much work to catch up on. Oh, I see. That yeah. uh that's kind of overwhelming. So Yeah. which I know you're also in the hustle and bustle of getting things done right now, but yeah, so that's been hard. It's like it's it's one of those there's so much to do that it's one of those times where it's like I need to take 20 minutes to sit down and just figure out and prioritize what I actually need to do yep. because there's so much that I'm I'm not actually doing things efficiently even because I'm just like running around trying to figure out what to do. And anyways, can I, can I go to confession real quick? Yeah. So I, I sat down, I had that exact same feeling and this is what you do not do. So little ones learn from me, do not do this. Um, but I got up for morning prayer and I was already incredibly stressed and morning prayer is just the first thing I do during the day. And I was like, how am I going to get everything in? Literally it's one thing after the other, as you know, two of my appointments this morning have involved you and both of them I was a bit late for. And, and just cause like everything is butting up right up against each other today. And I don't, so anyway, but it's going to be nice. I already, I already told myself I was going to go to my, my usual spot and have a drink and do some, do some, uh, chatting with, with the locals, um, tonight after everything's over. Um, I know you don't care about baseball, but this is this is Dodgers and Giants game one of the uh, division series tonight um, for the World Series. But uh, we beat the Cardinals two nights ago in the wild card. Anyway, so I'm like, I'm so busy, I'm missing that whole thing. And then somebody actually said, instead of doing what we were going to do in the evening, what if we went and watched the baseball game? And I was like, that would be awesome. 
I only have an hour, so I can't obviously watch the whole game. But we, if we watch, instead of what we we're going to do, we, we watch the game for an hour. That'd be, that'd work for me. So anyway, so that was a little bit of a like, oh, and then I'm going to go for a drink after all of it's over and get like no sleep tonight, which is my usual. Um, where was it? That was a total pearl. This morning um, before Matt's. I was, oh yes, thank you. My confession. So I sat down this morning and I started praying the Jesus prayer and I pulled out my phone and went through my whole schedule and even sent a few texts and like put things on my to-do list. <laughs> and then, and I was like, I was like, Lord, I'm going to be prayerful while I do this. And so like, but being prayerful meant, and my ADD allows me to be prayerful and other things at the same time quite easily. But I'm like, putting the Jesus prayer beads through my fingers without praying the Jesus prayer. But like, as I, as I'm doing the other things, trying to get it all together. Um, so, but the last thing I did, the last thing I did was for the first time in my whole life, enable screen time on my iPhone so that I could say in a, on a day like this, I need to make sure that I am not wasting any time. Mm. So screen time on my iPhone just allows me to see how much time I'm spending on all the different apps. Mm. So it's going to be like, you know, how much time did I spend on social media a day like this? I cannot do that. Like, even if it's for the podcast, even if it's for my ministry, I, I can't do that because it's not necessary. It's not urgent and it's, it's not important. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm going to literally do that. And I already found myself three or four times today about to click on Twitter or something like that and being like, nope, 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 nope. It's going to show up on my screen time. So I'm not going to do this, but I, but the shame of it was that I was, when I was supposed to be praying Jesus prayer, which is supposed to orient me and empower me for the whole day. Here I am like trying to be in control myself and saying, well, I need to do this. Mm -hmm. And Jesus can't, Jesus can't get my schedule all online. Jesus can't text back these people. So therefore I need to do it without him, which is complete heresy, of course. <laughs> so I, I totally should have just sat there praying the Jesus prayer. It would empower me to do much better throughout the day. Um, but anyway, so that was, I apologize to Jesus through you, Holy Mother, um, that uh, that I should have been praying the Jesus prayer for that fifteen minutes or twenty minutes, whatever it was, rather than rather than organizing my day. But it happened. It's, so sorry. It's God who forgives. And I've often, if this makes you uh, feel any better, I don't know why I should because you're much holier than me. But <laughs> um, but I often use the kathisma to like <laughs> jot down little notes or something like that of if I've suddenly thought of something that I need to. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. I don't like there's something wrong with me spending almost the entire Jesus prayer time <laughs> like on my phone getting things done. Um, I do not think there's wrong with I even have. I, you know, don't tell my bishop. I don't think he'd mind. He probably does the same thing. But I even have a little piece of paper in my in my priest book, mm -hmm. in my eucologian, um, the the up, up there on the, and I have a pen in my pocket, and I will like pull out that sheet of paper and just like scrawl something even during the liturgy. Mm -hmm. Like, cause it, like if it comes to my head, it's just, it allows me to pray better if I just get it down and done. And then I don't need to like, okay, how do I remember this? Like what little technique do I, th do I think of to remember this so that after the divine liturgy is over, I can go back to it. It's like, if I write it down, I don't need to worry about that anymore. It's now written down. I would never have my phone up there to do that because notifications pop up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I don't even like the little vibrations of the phone for notifications in my pocket during prayer. Cause that's, it's not too distracting for me cause my ADD, but it is distracting enough. So I will, I love just pen and paper, scrawl it down, stick it back in the book, get on with the prayer. I don't think anything wrong with that. Okay. So see, you are holy. <laughs> I can't believe you just made that sound on the, it worked in the mic. It's a good thing. I'm the only one that uses this microphone. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's true. Uh, well, I mean, it's not like, it's not like when someone else uses the microphone, they're like eating it or licking it or something. So any germs that I don't get know, on it, it just would feels stay weird. on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're the uh, scientist. You tell me. Oh gosh, I don't. Even, I, I wouldn't even consider myself a scientist anymore at this point. You're a scientist. I've been I've been out of out of the field for so long now. Um, By the way, I was talking to Maddie. What's 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 kinesiology? What did she study in college? Kine what did kinesthetics? she study? Yeah. I don't. I don't remember what she studied. I know that she's now studying. Um, not just any counseling, but counseling. Like, but what was it? And in, in undergrad, she studied like kinesiology or something like that. I don't remember. That. Okay, I'm just embarrassing myself now. Sorry, Maddie. Matt, Maddie, when you hear this, if you can text me what exactly you studied in undergrad, so I don't embarrass myself ever again, and I can if I can you, look it up on my phone. If you can also tell him whether you have curly or straight hair, that would be helpful. Oh my gosh! <laughs> just put it in the text. <laughs> 
put in the text, but I have curly hair, whatever you have, just put it in there so that I can have like have a list of, of references. Listen, if it from if, the things I forget. Here's another thing to make you feel better. I am like the least observant person. Maybe not least, because I would have known that Maddie had straight hair, but I'm very <laughs> unobservant. Have I have I told the story? Do you know if I've t- told the story before on the podcast about how unobservant I am and how the nuns like laugh about this? And just say it again for okay. the newbies. So I that's true. So I um, the the first time they realized this, I've known it my entire life because I remember mm-hmm. one time someone asked me. They were coming over to my house, and they were like, uh, you know, they texted to say, "What color is your house?" So they knew what they were looking for, <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> I I should know this because I've lived here for like six years um, and I literally didn't know what color my house was. And then I had to go outside and look and text them back and that was horribly embarrassing. And then well, I'm guessing it was a pretty bland color. If it was like red, you'd have been like, oh, the red one. I think it was blue. Well, I guess unless it was brick. It was, it was brick, but like painted brick. I think it was brick. I have no idea what the color my house is right now. You got me thinking. Like I'm looking at the, the church is white, that but as far as that makes me feel so much better. The so outside then, of the house, I'm, the office I'm sitting right now. I have no idea. So I've known it for a while. The nuns found this out when I'd been at the monastery for maybe I don't know six months to a year. And Mother says, because uh, she's like buying some stuff or whatever, and she's like, "Do you have curtains in your room?" <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> "I." Uh, <laughs> I should know that. And they all look at me like, how How do you not know if you have curtains in your room? And I was like, uh. So have you met my spiritual father? It's we, in the <laughs> so we go and look and uh, I did not have curtains. So, uh, so we got some. That's awesome. I was like, what do you, what do you need curtains for? I don't like the blinds seem to work enough. I, anyway, I, I don't really understand those things. Because girls like pretty flowy things. Yeah. That. That must be it. So the your question actually leans very well. Your question was the if I'm different after honeymoon. And it is mm-hmm. things are very different. Um the I think the the easiest way to state it is I just at, at the profession on the profession day and for the the eight days of honeymoon, I'd said it was ten days on the last episode, but it actually was eight. I forgot that. Um, two episodes ago, I said it was 10. It was eight. Uh, but the profession day itself and then the eight days of honeymoon following were just the most peace and joy I've experienced in my whole life uh, by far. And I, I had told you, Father Michael, and I was telling you uh, just first first uh, things after the honeymoon, I said that it was almost pure consolation. And like in the eight days of honeymoon, I had maybe four or five hours of desolation of any kind. And uh, and I was like, this is amazing. And I was like, is this what Father Michael's life is like all the time? <laughs> and so then when I was telling you about it, I was like, uh, is this is this what life is like for you? And I said, well, you know, obviously not not that drastic of it. And you were like, no. Nope. No, it's pretty. It's pretty much what life is like. <laughs> you know what I've realized? I realized that one of the reasons, one of the gifts God gave me that why I feel just so consoled all the time is that he gave, I, I'm so, I don't know if it's sanguine or phlegmatic. I'm, I'm like 98% both of those things by personality that he gave me. But but I I just switch between things very quickly. Like I'll switch from happiness to sadness, like a light switch, and then switch it right back again. <laughs> it's not like they're, they're, now I take that back. Even this morning, was it this morning? Uh, yeah, I woke up this morning feeling a little bit like odd and a little bit down. I was like, "What happened yesterday that like is still lingering?" I was like, "Oh, that's what it was," you know. Mm. But even then, I was dealing with a very stressful situation yesterday, and then Andrew Whaley comes in and goes. You want to get dinner? And I was like, yep. And then literally it was like a light bulb. I'm like, I'm like skipping down the hallway. Dinner time, dinner time. Gonna go. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, I, lo- I love that I could turn it off from like this stressful situation. And then I just like, oh, let's go get food with Whaley. It'll be fun. And then there's, yeah, that's just not my life. Remember, <laughs> do you remember when we were at the airport? Uh, the When I was leaving after my home visit and it was the home visit that Father Michael McCandless and Father Steve oh, Flynn had come. I remember well. <laughs> I was I was laughing at you in my head the whole day and like 
what is wrong with this girl? I, yeah. Father Michael, <laughs> I'm sorry. there's so much, there's so much wrong with me. The, so this would have been back in 2016. And I, it was the year, I, I came back for Laura and Johnny's wedding. And, and Father Michael McCandless and Father Steve Flynn and my friend Father Zach Maybe from Michigan had come to hike a 14er with me. And uh, Father Steve and I were taking the same flight back to Ohio. And so you, Father Michael, brought me to the airport and we were hanging out and having breakfast at the airport before my flight took off. And we're waiting for Father Steve and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm getting more and more anxious. And I there had been like, I'd gotten one text from him the night before saying, or maybe it came in that morning saying that he, what time he was going to be at the airport. And the time that he said was like during boarding time or something, something crazy of just like, <laughs> this won't work. And I texted back and said, I hope you're kidding. And he didn't reply and didn't reply and didn't reply because he was in the mountains at Camp Foytiwa. Mm -hmm. And it turned out what happened was he'd gotten the times like the, his phone hadn't changed the time zones or something mm -hmm. like that. And so two, three hours off. Um, two. two hours off, three hours off, two hours off. <laughs> Depending on how you count. Oh, because it was, it was <laughs> that's right. No, it was Rocky Mountain. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he ended up just, anyways, he like flew to the airport, no pun intended, and ended up being um, almost missing the flight. And I had coffee ready for him. And I was standing in line to order him coffee because I knew he was coming. And he texts and says, can you get me a coffee? And I was like, sure. <laughs> uh, so anyways, we talk about that sometimes. It's just like an analogy for how God is often working to fulfill our desires before we mm -hmm. even know the desires ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But So Mother, Mother Tali and I were sitting there eating breakfast <laughs> and she was looking just so, and I was like, Mother, if he, I didn't say mother, I was like sister, <laughs> whatever you were, dokimos. Um, I was like, if he misses the flight, he'll just get the later one. Like, it'll be fine. And she's like, and like, you just, you were so worried. Like you were but like, the thing I was like, is, there's nothing you could do. There's literally nothing you can do right now. And I was just a ball of anxiety. And I was, <laughs> yeah. it was horrible because I wasn't, I wasn't just enjoying the fact that I'm here with my spiritual father who I love so much and miss terribly. And I'm not just like here in the present moment, enjoying this time with him. I'm just a ball of anxiety. It was, yeah. oh, it was so horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, I, I'm, I'm laughing at you, but absolutely that's 90% of people. <laughs> like you're, you're actually the normal. Like I'm the one who's just like, he'll get a later flight. It's fine. Let's enjoy the moment. <laughs> it was very selfish too, though, because it wasn't, uh, I knew he would get a later flight, but the point was this was my first home visit. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to Ohio. <laughs> I want mm -hmm. to stay in Colorado in the place that I love with the people that I love. Not that I don't love the other nuns as well, but um, it was really, really hard for me to go back. And so I was like, mm -hmm. my one consolation was Father Steve's going to be on this flight uh -oh. with me. And I love him dearly and he's going to help me. Um, as I sob, which he did. I like okay. sobbed as we pulled away <laughs> and uh, I watched the mountains get smaller and smaller and I just wept and um, and he was my Okay, my that's comfort. sweet, but, fine. Yeah. So honeymoon was pure consolation. It was just absolutely glorious. And, and one of the things, I didn't tell you this when we talked earlier. I'm going to share something else. But uh, I was kind of walking through the graces with you of honeymoon and I only made it through day three, I think of the eight days. And, but towards the end, uh, it, the, the readings, so we had daily mass or daily divine liturgy every day. And we had the reading of, uh, the gospel reading of Martha and Mary twice because we had it for our Byzantine feast of holy protection because that's the feast we, the reading we always have for Marian feasts. Mm -hmm. And then we had it also for a daily mass because it was the f reading for the Romans for maybe, I don't know who, some saint, but we had it twice. The second time we had it, 
I there's the obvious application, right, of Jesus says to to Martha that Mary has chosen the better part. And that's that's clearly applicable to monastic life and even mm-hmm. to my time on honeymoon where I'm just resting with the Lord, sitting at his feet and enjoying the consolation <laughs> and and my sisters are bringing me food and and all of that. And so there's the obvious application of that. But then Father Patrick Anderson was giving the homily that day. He had mass for us that day. And he said, he was talking about that part when, when Jesus says to Martha that Mary has chosen the better part. And he said, imagine what it was like for Mary to hear those words. And because I, I think that we often, when we pray with that, we pray with what Martha was experiencing, but, but imagine what Mary felt when she heard Jesus say those words. And then he said, he said, but, but also beyond that, imagine what she felt to hear the next words when he says, it shall not be taken from her. And just this, this protectiveness of the Lord or from the Lord of our relationship with him and that, that security that he gives. And so I was praying with that and, and I was really, really convicted by that of this peace and this joy that the Lord has given me from this time with him it shall not be taken from me. Nobody has either the right or the power to take it from me. Now that doesn't mean that I can't choose to give it away. (laughs) You know, um, like the moment in the airport, I could have chosen to, to, to rest in the present moment and to be with you and with the Lord in the present moment. But instead I chose to kind of give into the anxiety. And of course there's all the nuances of mental illness here. And so I'm not going to get into all that. I'm not trying to make people feel guilty if they have anxiety or something. But, uh, but my point being that I've really, for the past, I don't know, how long have I been out now? Just a few days. That makes it sound like prison. Uh, but I got out Tuesday night and today's (laughs) Friday. So whatever that means, depending on how you count. And I've, (laughs) I've really been able to, to hold on to that peace and joy for the most part. Um, But uh, uh, something that I've realized that has changed is in the moments where I do slip out of that and I'm like short with someone or I'm, I've been very, I've, I've been recovering much more quickly and, um, and it's like, okay, I'm sorry for that. And I will apologize to that person and I'll confess this, but that doesn't mean that I can't then choose to move on with life. <laughs> um, so that's been really good. It is, it is. I've learned through, a, you know, life events the past few years that um, there is, it's never, we can never kind of measure our virtue or our vice. We can never measure how we've loved or how we've, mistreated people and we're not supposed to measure because it, God prevents us from understanding the full consequences of our actions. Cause I think if we knew we'd go crazy, mm-hmm. um, he, like he doesn't, he hides from us in a sense. I know that's probably not the proper terminology, but he keeps us from understanding the, the, the impact negatively that we've had because we would despair and positively we've had probably because we'd grow very, very arrogant. Um, and we would attribute to ourselves what he has done with it, but mm-hmm. um, that we cannot measure it. So there's something beautiful about saying, and I, I'm sorry, this is kind of off topic, but it's just, I thought when he said that, there's something beautiful about saying we are going to live. What, what is the what is the uh, um, the petition in the litany of our fervent supplications say? Um, something that we're asking our Lord to grant us a life of repentance and oh my gosh. I'm um, uh, we're, we're asking God to grant us repentance for the rest of our life somehow with mm-hmm. one of the petitions. I forget the exact word. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 it, but there's something about that. It's like, and that, that's appropriate. Like we will, we will try to grow in love every single moment of every single day. And we'll pray that we repent every moment of every single day, mm-hmm. except that we have these fasting seasons, feasting seasons, fasting days, feasting days. So there's this, there's this, you know, more engagement, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be celebrating all the time. Christ's death and resurrection, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be repenting of our own sin and, and asking Christ to purge it every single moment, but we get these ins and outs. But I, I've, I've realized that 
what happened was when somebody hurt me, I just said, you know, I've probably hurt people this bad. I probably have as much as I'm hurt right now. So I probably have done that. So therefore, since I don't know that, it's not obvious to me, I just need to make sure that I am living a life of, of repentance all the time. Mm. That I'm always saying, Lord, please um, purge from me the sin that is affecting my own salvation and please continue to work through this prayer and through your grace healing those who I've hurt, even the ones I do not know, mm -hmm. you know, even the ones I, and I will never know, and I will never understand the full impact. So we, it just has to be pervasive. The celebration and the repentance has to be pervasive. Um, but since we exist in time and space, God gives us days and seasons for that. Yeah. Um, Perla done. Back to topic. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was on top. It was in response to what I said. It was good. The, so, so, I guess that's kind of been the transition from honeymoon. But what I, the reason I say it was a good question to start this episode is because I really want to share at least one or two graces from honeymoon. And I want to start with, with how the Lord built upon the grace that I initially shared on the podcast right after the profession. So when we did the live episode on Monday evening, the day after the profession, I had shared that one of the biggest graces for me was just the intimacy that I felt with the Lord during the profession and for the whole liturgy and how I was, it was, it was very clearly supernatural, very clearly grace because I'm not usually so attentive and so focused on the Lord during divine liturgy. <clears throat> and I'm very, I'm very much like, just observing all of the beauty that's going on around me in the liturgy, be it people or icons or whatever. And, um, but, but this particular day I was completely focused on the Lord. And so that was the grace that I had shared and how I was surprised by that because of how many people were there, right? There were, um, probably about 350 people there, um, or close to it. 40 mm -hmm. of whom were priests that all of them, I just love very much. And, um, and so the fact that I wasn't focused on any of the people and, and was just focused on the Lord and that I could experience that intimacy in the midst of the crowd, uh, was, was one of the graces that I'd shared on the podcast. So on my honeymoon, I was praying with that and just asked Jesus, how is this even possible? How is it possible to have this kind of intimacy with you with so many people around because it's not, um, yeah, it's just not what you would expect. And in response, an image, an image came to mind um, in prayer, and it was the image of the the gospel, the gospel account of the hemorrhaging woman. So, in our Eastern tradition, uh, the hemorrhaging woman is given the name Saint Veronica. She, it's been unclear. I was trying to look up whether the East believes this is the same St. Veronica that the West says, um, the Western tradition says that wiped the face of Jesus um, on his way to the crucifixion. And it's unclear as to whether or not this is the same Veronica, but she's given the name Veronica in tradition, the hemorrhaging woman. I, I need to ask um, our friend Brandon from the pair. She's a mm. Latin and Greek scholar, because I think, Veronica, I was going to ask you this, means true image. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to embarrass myself, but isn't ver, isn't that true in like, real, is that the etymology in Latin? Um, I would assume so. Okay. So true image. And then I, I anyway, the Greek, because the, the Orthodox also gave everything named Bernice which is just mm -hmm. a much harsher name in my, in my, in my mind than for, I like Veronica better, but I'm wondering if Bernice has more, but I'm really sorry, sorry if we have any Bernices who listen. No, Your it's name a beautiful is... name. It's just, it's more, it's more it's harsh. harsh. Than, it's, it's like Michael. <laughs> See, I'm, tr I'm trying to not stop embarrassing myself. So yeah, Bernice is a lovely name, Bernice. Okay. Can I go back to my grace? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So the image that can came- I have a question oh. when we pause? I'm going to write it down so don't forget. Okay. Uh, you would write it down even if it was during the Divine Liturgy. So the the image hey. that came to mind was Veronica as the hemorrhaging woman. And 
in whenever I whenever I pray with that gospel, it's always the the bottom hem of Jesus's garment. I don't know if, but anyways, that's what I was praying with. And so I was seeing her in my prayer, just crawling on the ground, fighting through this crowd, trying to remain unseen and unnoticed and to just slip in. But she's, she's totally focused on Jesus, right? She has one goal in mind, which is um, get to this man and be healed. This is her one goal. And so she touches the hem of his garment. Jesus says, you all know the story. Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, what do you mean who touched you? You're surrounded by a hundred kajillion people. Like everyone's touching you. And he says, no, I've, I've felt power leave from me. Someone touched me. And he turns and he looks at Veronica and he says to her, oh, I didn't even bring my Bible. Oh, while I'm talking, Father Michael, you need to look up, please the the daily um oh never mind i can look it up i got it don't worry about it um because i remember actually what it is so (laughs) sorry so (laughs) your face right now is fantastic you look like disgusted (laughs) with me so no i'm just confused um it's fine i'm confusing myself so jesus says to veronica (laughs) something along the lines of your faith has made you well go in peace be healed of your disease and I thought this was really appropriate for, obviously it's appropriate. Good job, Jesus. You picked the right image to give me in prayer. <laughs> um, because not only because in, in my prayer, as I'm, as I'm seeing this, it's just this extremely intimate moment between the two of them, even though she's, they're surrounded by people. Um, like Veronica is probably just not even caring about what these other people are thinking or seeing or saying, but she's totally focused on the Lord. Um, so there's that, the intimacy in the midst of a crowd, but there's also just his words. I'm like, these are the words that Jesus speaks at a life profession to, to the, Mm -hmm. the women who are coming forth as repentant sinners to enter the ranks of the penitent, um, to enter this, this life of fully professed monasticism. He's saying, you've come here in faith. Now go in peace, be healed of your disease, spend the rest of your life being healed from the self-inflicted wounds of your Mm -hmm. sin. And so that's wonderful. Um, Do you want to say something before I move on to the second image that he gave me in prayer? Was it about Veronica? Yes. Then I'll wait until the end. Okay. So so then after, after I pray with that, another image comes on my heart, which is, the other Veronica, or maybe the same Veronica, uh, there's, I'm hearing different stories as to whether or not they're the same. But when, when Veronica approaches Jesus as he's carrying his cross and wipes his face with her veil, and, um, and I, as I was sitting with that, it's like, this is another time that she experiences this very intimate moment with the Lord in the midst of this crowd. And the beauty of this one for me was, was the first image was the start and the duration of my monastic life, this, this uh, process of being healed. And, but this second one is like Veronica again had just this one focus. She was very singularly focused but her focus this time was not on her own healing. It was on bringing some small consolation, some small comfort to the Lord. And, and this is what I really feel my, my calling is, is to wipe the blood and the sweat off of the face of Jesus in the face of others. And mm-hmm. beautiful to, to really encounter him in others. And... So I was um, sharing this grace with Father Damien. This two episodes in a row, we've talked about Father Damien. So shout out to Father Damien Ferentz. I was sharing this grace with him and he said, you know, the name Veronica means, as you already said, Father Michael, true image. He said, that's why the West gives her this name, um, this nickname, if you will, is because of um, the image of the face of the Lord being on the, on her veil. And um, which side note, the other thing that was beautiful to me about having these two images in prayer is, is reunification between East and West is very important to me personally, but also to our monastery. Like we really desire to be a bridge between East and West. So I thought it was very appropriate that 
the first image that came to me was this Eastern tradition of Veronica being the hemorrhage woman and the second being this Western tradition Um, because you see in Stations of the Cross and stuff like that, it's not actually scriptural um, of Veronica wiping the face of Christ. So anyways, Father Damien says, this means true image. And he said, you're, you're a, I'm paraphrasing. So if Father Damien's listening, I'm sorry if I'm misquoting you, but he says, you're espoused to the Lord. You are now a truer image of him than you were before. And, and he was just expressing that, that this is my calling is to have this intimacy with him in the midst of the crowd, be it a crowd of people, be it the greater crowd of the church, the greater crowd of the world. And then, and then he shared something that I thought was, was very, um, is very profound uh, and yet very simple. He said that at the seminary, the way they teach celibacy here in Cleveland is, is they, they say that as a married couple, you are loving the many through the one. But as a celibate, you're loving the one through the many. So, so this, is a, this is what I was describing of wanting to wipe the blood and sweat off of the face of Christ in the face of others, right? I'm, I'm encountering him in all of these people and trying to love him through them. And uh, yeah, so anyways, that was that, was that grace. <coughs> Amen. Um, so my thinking of this, my question that led me while you were talking um, to, uh, anyway, I'll just share it. <laughs> so w- why I get in the Western tradition, why the woman who wiped our Lord's face with her veil, why she was given the name Veronica, but why in the Eastern tradition, and I'm not saying there's a good answer for this. I'm just saying like, do, do you, can you think of a reason why the woman who, with the flow of blood, who touched the tassel of his cloak, was healed by her faith, was called daughter after uh, after a flow of blood for twelve years. Why she was given the name by the East, true image, hmm. or why her name is true. I like Fotina again. We gave her that name, the woman at the well, because um, it just means light, and she, and she, in a sense, brought the light of Christ and the living water to the town. And that, that's, I mean, it's, it's interesting that she wasn't named after the water, but she was named after the light. Um, but, but is there anything, and the, the, the answer I thought of while, while you were talking was maybe it's, it's the fact that the, the, there's actually the true image, not of Jesus, but of the true image of the daughter. Mm. Because remember, he calls her daughter and he's, he's about to go here, heal Jairus' daughter. So mm-hmm. here she is like, Jairus' daughter is Jairus' daughter. She's the true image of Jesus' daughter. You know, the, the, the one who, who is, is beloved of him like, like a daughter. Now, it, it might be something else. That's just the only possible thing I could think of to think of why we would use that name, true image, Veronica or Bernice for this woman. Do you have any insights? I don't, no. Um, so the next thing I thought of though, so it might be something else. And if, if you know, um, or if you have the time to look it up, let us know. Um, but I also thought it, it's an interesting with the, with the Roman tradition of the veil, um, there, if these are tied together, um, if, if it is the same Veronica and actually one thing I thought of that was pretty funny, um, in my mind at least was that, uh, that, you know, we may in like, okay, was it the same Veronica or not? We don't know. Some traditions say yes. Some traditions say no. Um, but if that's the case, like I can imagine if there's one Veronica and she's up in heaven and she's like, oh, they just, I was in both those places, but they just don't, they think I'm two separate women. That's fine. But if it's two and they're like, oh, they're up in heaven as saints and they're like, oh, they think we're the same person. And and I could totally imagine like you and one of the other mothers of the monastery just laughing about that. And I thought, Christ the bridegroom really is like a little taste of heaven. Like I can imagine these two women who encountered Christ in such incredibly important ways. And then just kind of laughing that people are confused about who they are, mm. you know, and, and it's, and so th- I imagine these two beautiful women, Veronica and Veronica, if there are two of them in heaven, kind of laughing like you would laugh with one of your other mothers, if 
Father Michael or somebody else was confused about who you were or he said something stupid uh, and, and, and got something confused and you were just, you laughed about the confusion of it. And then I was like, that's, that's so that, that's because that, that's my image of how we interact in heaven is sometimes how really beautiful, amazing people interact here in this life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in addition to that, I thought, um, this is all, these are all the thoughts I was thinking while you were, <laughs> while you were talking. So, but my, my brain can do that. But um, I wonder if, if it is, one woman, then I, I wonder if the tie then is between she, it's almost like we have with Peter, right? At the beginning of the gospels, Peter says, depart from me, Lord, from a sinful man. At the end of the gospel, he, after the resurrection, in his sin, he actually runs towards Christ because mm-hmm. he, 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 he gets dressed, jumps out of the boat and runs towards Christ. So in the same way, he wanted separation from Christ because of his sin in the beginning of the gospels. He wanted nearness to Christ because mm-hmm. of his sin at the end of the gospels. And that's conversion. That's growth. That's holiness is that we, he sinned both times, but instead of running away, he ran too. And mm-hmm. that, that's just a, a, a beautiful conversion story of St. Peter. I wonder if the same thing here is at the beginning of her journey, in a sense, she, she touched the hem of his, the tassel of his garment and, and received power from him at the end, in a sense, she offered the tassel of her garment or, or the veil part of her garment to bring him comfort. Mm. So, so he gave her comfort through the engagement with, with part of his garment. And now she's giving him comfort through the engagement with one of her garments. Like this is just, she's now received. So now she's going to give anyway. I have no idea if anybody's, talked about that but it could be beautiful yeah that is very beautiful i uh that actually leads into i couldn't decide what to share next <clears throat> so you just uh kind of gave me what i want to share next but oh, before yeah. i do that i did just have this thought if they do if the tradition is that they're the same woman mm-hmm. it could very simply be that she was given the name veronica because of the veil and so we just call her Veronica in both. So it's not like if there's another point at which we think Fotina was doing something, it's not like she has to be called Fotina yeah. because of everything she's done. So yeah. like Peter was was called Peter because the Lord changed his name at the one time. It yeah. wasn't like every instance with Peter. So does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. So, um, so actually that might that might be all the more support of the tradition being that they are the same woman yeah. is why else would she have the name Veronica because of this? So Mm. uh, anyways, so the other thing I'll share as you're talking about, it reminded me of what I shared with you about Father James's homily, Father James Colway. So shout out to Father James Colway. I hope these priests are okay that I'm sharing this. They, they, I mean, they probably don't listen to the podcast anyways. So, but someone's going to tell them that keeps happening. Um, Anyways, the, when you're talking about this experience of Peter first wanting first like looking down or wanting to um to feeling like he can't be in the presence of the lord because of his sinfulness and then making the transition to wanting to be in the lord's presence and to be with him because of his sinfulness it reminded me of this experience that i had at the profession that i was telling you of like i said earlier so much joy so much peace more than i've ever experienced in my life however I also felt deeply repentant and, and, and acutely aware of my sinfulness. And it was like, I could have both of those things simultaneously. I could be, I could be acutely aware of my sinfulness and also completely joyful. And, and it was this, which I've like had small tastes of at other points in my life, but the life profession, it really just like, the two went hand in hand and it was perfectly fine and there was no contradiction. And and when I was trying to describe to you earlier what it was like, I was saying that it's very different from the other times in my life where I've I've been very aware of my sinfulness and it's just drawn me into into despair or self-condemnation or or I've at least like even the moments that I've handled it quote unquote well, it's like I had to fight to handle it well. <laughs> it, it didn't just like come to me. And that's because in those, in those times in the past, I think most of the time I looked at my sin, I was looking at it in a very like self-centered way. I, I was looking at myself in my sin. 
Whereas at the life profession, like I said, I had this grace of being totally focused on the Lord. And, and so it's like any awareness of my sinfulness, I'm aware of it while looking at him with this unbroken gaze. And it's like, I'm not looking at myself, I'm looking at him. And so it's not a, a self-condemnation or a dejection over my sinfulness. It's an awareness of the presence of the Lord. And thus this very natural result of that, which is an awareness of my own inadequacies in his presence. Um, but it didn't at all make me want to pull away from him. It only wanted me, it only made me want to further rest in his presence, um, knowing that he's the only one who can cleanse me of this sin. And uh, yeah, so that, that transition was just, oh, so anyway, so Father James, uh, Father James uh, is the one who had daily mass for us uh, one of the days of the honeymoon. And he said in his homily, um, he had a lot of really wonderful things to say in his homily, but one of my favorites was he said, um, he said, this life profession really had more of a penitential feel to it for me than, than the other life professions have had so far. And, and I was so moved by that because I felt exactly what he was saying. I, I, I had the same experience. Like, like the, the profession felt so penitent, penitential to me. And, but the reason I was moved by him saying it is because other than the bishop throwing the scissors, there was nothing, and, and it being in a different church, there was nothing objectively different between mine and Mother Petra's life profession and the other life professions that our monastery has had. But I think that it really was a fruit of of all of our prayers, but but particularly my my prayer as I've been um, all of the stuff that I talked about on the four profession episodes, you know, and and what I wrote in my letter that I put in the profession booklet, and all of that of just really wanting people to know what a life profession is, that it's, that it's about two sinners coming here or a sinner coming here in repentance. It's not about, um, like I've made it in holiness and, and there really is supposed to be this penitential aspect to it. And so, um, so anyways, I was very, I was very moved by him saying that. And I think that our, I, I think also when I was talking to mother about this, that our monastery, we've, we've always known obviously like what the church and what the fathers teach about monasticism and, and about um, we have the, the knowledge in our heads about what a life profession is supposed to be and the penitential aspect and all of that. But I think that our monastery as a whole, as a community, uh, because we're still very new, you know, we've only been around for 12 years. I think we now have a greater experiential understanding of the penitential aspect of it than we have at past professions. And so I think that really um, came through in this, in this profession. So, Yeah. Amen. I think that's true too, because I, I think I've been to every single life profession at Christ the Bridegroom. You have. Um, yeah. So, but I, I think you've that been to more than me because I wasn't at Mother's. That's true. That's true. Wow. Um, I I do. I'm gonna I tell Olivia think... that if she makes her life profession to not invite you, so that we can <laughs> hide. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell her to invite me and not to listen to you. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, oh, I, I think that there's something really, really beautiful. There is is what you felt about the fullness of of repentance and of like, like the fullness of your sin and also the fullness of joy. Like that is the ideal for the Christian life mm. because the joy is what we feel and the sin is what we know. And the, and in a sense, there's, there's a knowledge of, of our sin that, that, that is there and that, but it's the purging of it. It's the fact that it's being taken from us by Christ is being conquered. Death and sin are being conquered that bring us that joy because it's not just about, 
a sheet of paper where our sins are listed and they're being taken off. And that can bring a certain kind of joy. But the joy is that, that, that they're being purged. They're being burned off by the presence of the fire that is God himself. And the closer we get to the fire, the, the more the impurities are, are purged, are burned off as if we're like a piece of gold. And the closer, you know, the closer a piece of gold gets to fire, it, it burns off the impurities and the gold becomes more pure. Like there's this, there's this, um, we're getting closer, becoming more like God. Um, but, but you, we cannot do that without acknowledging our sin and, and having it purged, having it, you know, removed because there is no sin in God. And so anything that is sin in us is, is not part of God. So that, the, that there's that joy of the, of growing closer and closer and closer to Christ, not because he likes us more or invites us closer. He always likes us most and invites us with full invitation, giving himself to us fully, but it's only our sin keeping us from him. So as we acknowledge and allow that sin to be purged by him to get, be, have gotten rid of through our own efforts and, and purgation and his grace, um, we have that that joy of, of the sin being purged. But for it to be purged, we also are aware of it. And that is helpful to us to be aware of it because then it gets purged and we have more joy as it's being purged. So I, anyway, your direct experience of that is just, is I think what is a little taste of heaven, is, mm-hmm. is what a little taste of holiness, I should say, because heaven, there is no sin. Um, but but there's still this, there's this taste of holiness of, 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 of that being purged and taken away. Mm. So I'm just, I'm glad that you got to experience that little microcosm of, of the spiritual life all in one, one moment or one moments in this week. Yeah. Yeah. And it really was a, um, it really was another Mount Tabor transfiguration experience, you know, of, um, that's, that's always just been my favorite feast and, you know, if, if, if people didn't listen to it, you're welcome to go listen to the episode we did on the transfiguration. But, uh, but it just reminded me so much of, of Peter, James and John being on the mountain and just, and just totally experiencing the glory of the Lord. And, um, and you can understand Peter, you know, wanting to, to stay up there and just to just stay in that glory. Like, Jesus, can I just build some some tents up here and some tabernacles? And um, you know what's interesting? I've never thought of this before, but Peter Peter offers to build three tents, right? To set up mm-hmm. or three tabernacles or whatever. So he's not he's not even thinking about tabernacles or tents for himself and for James them. and John. Yeah. Uh, I've I never think, thought I, yeah. about that. I think he just wants, he wants Peter, he wants Jesus, Moses and Elisha to stay there. Yeah. He wants them to remain mm-hmm. um, where, where he can find them. I know they're here. Mm-hmm. You know, I can, I can come find them. But you're right. I, there, there's in a sense, he was like, well, let's be, let's build six, you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> we'll all yeah. just hang out here together. Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. But, um, but it was that experience of, of, Okay, now I like go back out into into the world in a sense, um, even though it's just the world of my monastery. <laughs> uh, but but with that glory, um, yeah. I I had. I'm going to share this very quickly, but uh, there is one thing that I just thought of when you're talking about sin and the joy and the, all of that. You know, I was praying with. Gosh, now I'm not going to be able to find it. I was praying with the um, with John. Oh, where was it? Um, with John. Was I praying? Father Michael, say something. Say something. Um, wait, I found it. Don't worry about saying anything. So. <laughs> I was praying with, (laughs) um, with John 13 and I'd never really noticed before the ordering of things in John 13, the sequence of it. So Jesus predicts the betrayal of Judas Mm -hmm. and, and then he gives the new commandment, um, love as I have loved you. Um, love each other is the translation I have the RSV love each other as I have loved you. And then he foretells Peter's denial. So he predicts Judas and then love each other as I've loved you. And then he foretells Peter's denial. And I was just wondering if, if, if um, as I was praying with that, I was wondering if part of the reason for that specific sequence 
was was to kind of look out for Peter and make sure that he wouldn't be cast out when he denied the Lord. Um, because he's, so, so Jesus is saying like, he predicts that Judas is going to betray him. And then he says, love each other as I've loved you, which means um, remember when I knew this guy was going to betray me, but I washed his feet. <laughs> love, yeah. love each other to that extent, hmm. you know? Yeah. And so, um, so I wonder if, if when Peter denied Jesus, if the other disciples would have remembered his prediction of Peter's denial hmm. and remember it in the context of, of that witness of, of loving, yeah. um, knowing the betrayal. Um, yeah. So that Peter, hmm. uh, and, and I wonder if, if that support and, and, you know, maybe like Judas could have had the same support yeah. maybe. And he just um, from the other disciples, but he, he, instead turned in on himself and fell into despair. But if I, I wonder if it's like the love of the other disciples is what helped Peter hmm. to, hmm. Um, to turn to, to forgiveness instead of to despair. So, um, yeah. so anyways, I guess that's just an encouragement for all of us to, in recognition of our own sinfulness and also knowing the sinfulness of others, um, to, to love to love each other anyways as because that's what Jesus tells us to do. So it's very simple, but it's not easy. They, they, they oftentimes say when, when a guy leaves seminary to discern marriage or whatever, that, that like he, oftentimes they'll say, you know, I left and everybody forgot about me. Mm-hmm. Like no one checked up on me. I was mm-hmm. so close with these other guys in the seminary. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden I leave. And I mean, and in a way, in a human way, that's understandable. Like we're, we don't have a shared life anymore, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm doing things here, you know, but, but there, there is this, it, it is a feeling of abandonment when you, when you switch something and you can imagine with sin is even worse. You know, it's like, well, I, I've, I've kind of separated myself from this community, not by discerning something else in this case, but by actual sinning, you know, we still need to like check up on people like that, you know, mm-hmm. to, to say I, it's the, the separation from the community. If there's excommunication, that's good to draw you back in. But if it's, if, if it's just a human, you know, if it's a human engagement, so, I mean, I oftentimes when I, when I hear somebody else say this, I'm like, Oh, who do I need to check, check in on, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess if you're hearing this, use this as a, uh, use this as an inspiration to, take to prayer who you need to check up on and make sure that just because someone separated themselves from you or the community in some way that you, you haven't, you haven't uh, disregarded their, even their salvation, you know, Mm -hmm. but rather sometimes it is that, it is that at least ongoing human support. If it's discerned as being helpful, that can, that can draw them back in. Yeah. So those are some graces from honeymoon. Amen. I'm still, I'm still kind of in the, I'm still definitely in the honeymoon phase. So Still lots Good. of consolation, lots of living the Father Michael life. <laughs> it's a good life. I'll tell you that. I like it. I've never before, anytime you've talked before about like just consolation, I'm like, I can't even relate. I don't even understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and now if if this fades, then the next time we talk about it, I'll be like, oh, I do remember what that was like. <laughs> exactly. So... Um, Hopefully, our Lord will not do the opposite. Me, he's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you what it feels like to feel <laughs> desolation almost all the time. Like, no, Lord, I can't handle it. I don't think he's gonna do that to you. I hope not. You never know. God's will be done. Give me the strength. Um. So, what is this episode coming out? I usually look at that ahead of time, but I didn't. Um. November seventeenth. It's no, sorry, November tenth. It's so weird to like record so far ahead mm. like that's, yeah, a, that's a month from now <laughs> yeah so anyways um oh please pray for our bridegroom's banquet which is happening november 13th so that's happening it when you're hearing this that's happening this saturday so i definitely should have talked about it more on previous episodes um We'll have to post something on Instagram or something. I'll you talk have to Olivia things about going that. on. I know. But uh, anyway, so our Bridegroom's Banquet, it's our annual fundraiser. If you want to, if you're not registered for the banquet, but you want to give a donation anyways, you can do that now or in the next three days online at christthebridegroom.org. And your donation 
we have a donor that's doubling, that's matching donations up to $100,000. So if you donate sometime in the next couple of days, it'll be matched. Amen. And this goes to support the life and ministry of Christ at Briagra Monastery, correct? Yes. Primarily this year, it's going to be for chapel renovations because we're doing all those things in our chapel that we're all so excited about. So, because our chapel, I mean, if you've been to the monastery and you've seen the lighting, you've seen the bathroom, um, you've seen the carpeting, you know that we need renovations so that we can pray for you. That's not true. We can pray anywhere, um, but we'll <laughs> pray less distractedly. We know what you mean. <laughs> so, um, so that's my prayer intention. Cool. Um, I'm going to be selfish and just uh, ask you, since I know the power of prayer, just pray for my herniated disc because it is, it is, it's getting to the point where I'm like, oh no, this is about to start preventing sleep, and that's exactly what happened last time, and it was a hellish six months. So if, if that's where this is going, God's will be done. Um, but I just, I, I have a, a herniated disc at C6 that, uh, that then radiates down my right shoulder, down my right arm, like pain in my elbow and then down to my index finger. So right now my index, right index finger is just tingly and, uh, and, um, and that's just all just from a herniated disc in my, in my spine. So, um, I probably had an injury when I was a kid and it just every once in a while that gets inflamed, the nerve gets inflamed. So anyway, if you could pray for that, I really don't want how to have surgery or anything like that. And that's probably on the horizon. Um, one of these times that it, it flares up, but I don't want it to be this time because I'm being selfish and I like, I like uh, just going on with my life. So if you could pray for my, my back, my neck, whatever you want to call it, my herniated disc, my right shoulder, um, that'd be awesome. It's, Appreciate it. It's so, I can't even tell you how difficult it is for me to see you in pain. Like it's really hard. Mm. I'm sure there's a lesson in there that I need That's to That's because I with, rarely but. am, but earlier during spiritual direction, whenever I would cough, it would just be like oh. shooting oh, pain. Oh, it was so sad. Although I was coughing just now and it really, it really wasn't that bad. So, but it just like, I, I need to continually move. Like I need to just like, keep my shoulder going backwards and forwards and resting it here, resting it there. Um, Cause it gives me little alleviations of pain whenever I do that. We had a Romanian priest at liturgy this past Sunday. Um, and He's one of the ones who comes and has liturgy for us regularly. And he, uh, in his homily, he is saying the, I like to move it, move it. And it was just like <laughs> the funniest, the, the, everyone in the chapel just burst into laughter. With the so, Romanian so. accent. Yes, exactly. Like that's what made it. Yeah, it just was great. That's so, hilarious. So. All right, I'll give a blessing. May the Lord bless you all and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, have mercy on you. May our Lord Send you forth this day to receive the good graces of his salvation, to seek out truth and beauty and goodness, to desire to receive from him what he wants to give, to be uh, truly receptive to the ways that he calls you to repentance, but also in the midst of that, an immense joy to hear how that has been experienced by, by the Natalia and to be open to that same experience in your own life. Um, to be zealous for the path of salvation, the pilgrimage to eternal life. Um, may our Lord also bless you in your, in your prayer and your generosity for Christ the Bridegroom Monastery and also for those of us in our community who are suffering in any way. Please give strength to those who suffer, Lord, if it is not your will to take away their sufferings. And please take away that suffering if it is your will. Lord, bless those who hear this, bless their families, their friends, their neighbors, their benefactors, and those they love. May our Lord bless all of you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Father. Love you. Love you, listeners. Love you too, sister. God bless y'all. Mother. Sorry. God bless you, Mother. Love you, Mother. Love y'all. Bye. Bye.